Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. And this week we are addressing something, well, that needs to be addressed, but the type of case that I don't love addressing because the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in Dobbs, state health officer of the Mississippi Department of Health versus Jackson Women's Health Organization is deeply divisive. And I have always said on this show, I I love covering pop culture. I don't love color covering politics, but it's not really politics. It's, and I've realized that as I've been working through this opinion, it's deeply divisive topics that are super polarizing that don't always fit well with what I do here. So today I'm going to tell you why I'm covering this case, how I parse through things that are difficult, because I think the process of going through things that are difficult is very much important. I think this decision um, upending a longstanding decision is an important one to go through. And there's been a lot of coverage of this case with commentary. I'm going to break down what the court said and decided, what the uh, the dissent said, and that's really it. We're just going to go through what this ruling is on the ruling, not a debate about the underlying issues of the ruling, just what this ruling says and what the dissent said about it, the way that we parse other things. And so many of you have asked, can we just go through the ruling that I wanted to, but first I do want to talk about how I parse through things that are deeply divisive because it takes energy, it takes time, and I think understanding my process and why I chose to cover this is also hopefully helpful. So with that, we're going to get into today's episode and right after the break, we will have, or right after the break, right after the intro, we will have one of our long standing sponsors who can make things a little bit easier even when things are busy and crazy and difficult. So with that, let's get into this week's episode of The Emily Show. Hey there, welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. Thank you to today's sponsor, Green Chef, who's now offering you more flexibility than ever before. Just in case everyone in your household doesn't eat the same way, you can now order a box to suit all the different lifestyles in your home. So vegan, vegetarian, keto, paleo, Mediterranean, fast and fit or gluten-free, you can order the meals that fit your family best all in one box. And now you have double the recipes, double the choices, up to 24 recipes weekly, and you can mix and match all those different meals. So not only are you getting premium organic ingredients that are fast and easy to make with your family or just have your family make them, depending on how busy you are. Emily, is that your life? Yes. Put a finger down for if you don't have time to cook. But it also comes to your door in a sustainable way. So not only do you get exactly what you need, but you get it when you need it to your door. Look, it's summertime. I hope you're not working as much as me and you're just getting out and enjoying it. And if you are knowing that dinner is going to be ready to go, delicious and healthy, that is absolutely worth it. So if you are ready to try Green Chef, go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker135 and use code emilybaker135 and get $135 off across five boxes plus free shipping on your first box. Do not sleep on this offer. It is a great way to try out Green Chef and get those meals delivered right to your door. So go to greenchef.com slash emilybaker135 for that deal and find out why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. We should get back to today's episode. So the first thing I want to say with covering this case, thank you for working through it with me, knowing that yes, we generally cover pop culture here, 
but I also feel that the purpose, not just of my content and my channel, but us as a law nerd community is that we can understand the law. Even when we disagree, this one is going to be hard for a lot, if not all of you, I completely understand that, which is why I wanted to talk about my process of working through things, particularly cases that are difficult because it's something that was part of my 1L year was going, hey, I don't agree with how this ruled, but how can I wrap my head around what the thought behind the ruling is and understand the why, even if I don't like the what. And I think that education has served me very well as I parse through things, not just in law, but in life. But because we are a law nerd community, I wanted to give you kind of my uh, boundaries, if you will, around this. I am not open for having a debate on abortion, and I am not going to facilitate that here. Your beliefs on abortion are your beliefs on abortion. This ruling does not determine where life begins. I am not engaging in that conversation either. I don't think I am in any way qualified to do that as by way of expert opinion. I'm certainly not. And a legal breakdown of this case for me does not need to facilitate that discussion. And there is so much space to have that discussion that needs to be had. My space is just not the proper space to do it because I am breaking down the law here and I don't want anyone to feel attacked based on their opinion. Your opinion is yours. And this case acknowledges it right at the beginning of the case that this that this, that abortion is a divisive topic because the beliefs are deeply held and widely differentiating between individuals. Again, your beliefs are yours, but this case impacts everyone in the U.S. who is under the laws of the U.S., and that is why I chose to break it down. When I come across things that I initially either very much like or very much don't like, the process is kind of the same for me. It's why do I like or dislike this? Like, why is my emotional reaction my emotional reaction? Why am I having the emotions that I'm having about this? Does this affirm something I believe about myself or the world? Or does this bump up against something I believe about myself, the world, my values, the way I see the world? Why do I either, why do I have a response to this headline, case, story, thing? And the bigger the emotional response from me, the more I find it necessary to do that evaluation. And that is something that I hope you will do too. If you've had a large emotional response to this case, just taking some time to sit with that and knowing it's okay to feel your feelings and then parse through them so that you can then evaluate the facts. It's okay to say, I'm in an emotional place on this. I'm not ready to evaluate the facts. I think that there's such a push for urgency in a response or in knowing what to do next or what happens next or what comes next or how to feel is a push to get out of the discomfort of unknowing and the discomfort of not liking something that has happened. But that push does not serve any of us well because big topics, immediate responses aren't often well thought, well informed, um, or easy. They're just our first responses. And so in taking time for this one, because of the timing of when this came down and my travel, but two, I wanted to go through this opinion and go through not just my own emotional response to it, but take that out of it and then go back through and see if I can understand the court's ruling, where they're coming from. If I can look at what the potential implications are, and then if I can look at the dissent and go, okay, where are they coming from so that we can present or we, I can present what the ruling was, what the dissent is, and what comes next, because those are the facts. There are a lot of feelings around this one. Just know that it's okay to have those feelings. Um, and it's okay to parse this in your own time. There's not I mean, the, the, the ruling is the ruling. It's overturned Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. That has happened. 
but the what comes next is going to be a slower process. So I hoped that talking about how I evaluate things and how I kind of parse the emotion first, and it's why I don't always have a fast response to things. There are definitely things where my response takes me a little bit more time because I am just not ready to parse it out with facts, not fuckery just yet. And I think we've not us law nerds, but I think society has gotten to a place where we are used to things being very quick. We are used to seeing a fast response to things. It's, I want to get on Twitter. What is people, what is being said? What is the response? What is, and sometimes it's just too fast for a learned or thoughtful response. And I hope that through what I do here, we can normalize a little bit that big things, it's okay to give it time to respond. And it's okay to say, I'm still processing this. I don't know what to say. And I know that there were those calling for um, creators. You have to speak out about this. Some need to parse how they feel before they can respond in a way that's in integrity for them and in a way that's aligned for their community. So I definitely try to give grace, especially when big things happen for people to take the time for not just understanding, which is very hard to do when we're emotional, but for um, reasoning and for getting through an opinion like this. This opinion, plus its concurrences and its dissents, uh, well, dissent, is really long. Like, it's really, really long. And so it took time. I mean, yes, this opinion was leaked. No, I did not read the leaked opinion. I waited to see if it became the opinion of the court. I've never seen a circumstance where there's been a leaked opinion of the court before. It was off-putting to me personally. I was like, what is happening here that I've never in my life? So I waited to see if this became the law of the land, and it has. And now we are going to parse through what it says, what it says it doesn't do, and what the dissent says. And that's really the best I can do. But it's also reminded me, A, I I am a long way from law school these days and parsing through constitutional texts are not my favorite way to break down the law. I truly am a pop culture legal commentator, but we get into things that are of such import that I hope that the way that I break things down help because I've seen so much distress coming from this um, that I hope an understanding of what the court has ruled, what the court has not ruled, and what the dissent says will help you parse where you stand with this case based on these facts. I will be linking below the link to this opinion. The Supreme Court also makes the oral arguments available. So if you want to go back and hear what the sides argued in this case, you can go back and access them. If you want more information, there is more information available. And there are those on all sides of this opinion that have given it a breakdown with their own take on the underlying issue here of abortion. I am going to go through, like I did with the UK ruling in the Johnny Depp case, the judges said this, and this means that. And that's how we're parsing through it. I am not going to read be warned, I am not going to read this opinion. I am going to go through uh, the things that I think are important. I am going to go through one of the concurrences that pointed out some things I did not know and had not seen in any of the coverage here that I thought were very interesting that I think you might find interesting, and then the dissent. So that is how I'm parsing it. I will, of course, link um, the opinion and then link the court's website where you can go find the oral arguments if you want to know more about this case. And again, um, it is a hard case to parse through if you don't have experience in parsing through these cases, just because some of the language they use is very much thickly legal. But I hope in my breakdown, I can give you enough of a footing that if you want to dive into this case deeper or any Supreme Court case deeper, you can find them and go read them. And if you want to read um, the underlying cases, Roe and Casey, they are available too, and I can link them as well. If you want to look at the the kind of scope of this together, not just taking the 
um, majority opinion word for Roe stood for this and Casey stood for this. Because today we're just going through what they said. I'm not challenging the things that they said. So now we know what our purpose and direction are. Let us get into this opinion. When you pull up this opinion, the first thing you will see is that there is a syllabus of the opinion. And I've pulled up my highlighted version. I have my own kind of method of highlighting. The syllabus gives us a quick take on the opinion from the court. So the syllabus is really the shorter version of the full opinion, but I'm just gonna go right to the holding from the syllabus and then into the main body of the opinion. Held, the constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey are overruled and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. What does that mean? What it means is that the legislature in each state is left to decide what the boundaries are for abortion, fully legal, fully illegal, somewhere in between. The court held nothing back. It turned all of those decisions over to the states. We know that states had laws that went into effect in the event that this was overturned and some laws that don't have laws that go into effect um, prohibiting abortion, whether this was overturned or not. What we do know is the court is saying squarely, this is in the hands of politicians. So what does that leave at first glance? That you have to talk to your politicians and that if we see a more, well, we're seeing a more originalist court, a court that really looks at the language of the constitution on its face and very narrowly or more narrowly construes that um, and less widely construes that, then a lot of the power um, of what is a right, what is not a right, is going to be left to politicians to decide, state legislatures and our national government, Congress and the Senate. Depending on which side of how you feel about states' rights or you know, large government control or smaller government control or how you feel about the functioning of our government, whether they can get anything done, I can understand the frustration of how is this supposed to be left to a government that doesn't get shit done like ever? Emily, didn't they have the opportunity to write Roe versus Wade into law like a lot? Yes. Yes, they did have that power. Um, no, they have not done that. Does that frustrate me? Yes. If the federal government would like the law of the land to be that abortion is protected at some point, then make it the law of the land. If you would like abortion to not be protected at some point, make it the law of the land. The court is really saying we're not legislatures. The legislatures should legislate. The dissent is saying, but this is a right that we found in the constitution and you are taking it away. So just throwing it up to the hands of politicians doesn't make any sense to us. And that is a, a quick recitation of what you're going to see throughout these cases as we get into it. Okay, before we move away from the syllabus, we're going to go through the syllabus's breakdown of stare decisis, um, S-T-A-R-E-D-E-C-I-S-I-S. -S. Emily, do you pronounce things in Latin? Well, no. But stare decisis is a doctrine you're going to hear a lot about. Well, let's just go to the Black's Law Dictionary of stare decisis. So stare decisis is Latin, shock, for to stand by a decision. But the doctrine generally applies to say that when you have a case, you must follow the earlier judicial decisions with, when the same points arise in a case or a litigation. Here, they are readdressing the question of abortion that has been previously addressed by Roe versus Wade, uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and other cases. So, of course, the first thing that will come up is, but what about adhering to previous doctrines? And the majority opinion says that while stare decisis plays an important role and protects the interests of those who have taken action in reliance on a past decision, it reduces incentives for challenging settled precedents, saving parties and courts the expense of endless litigation. It contributes to the actual and perceived integrity of the judicial process, and it restrains judicial hubris by respecting the judgment of those who grappled with important questions in the past, but goes on to say, but stare decisis is not an inexorable command and is at its weakest when the court interprets the Constitution. Some of the court's most important constitutional decisions have overruled prior precedents, and the court will lean heavily on Brown versus Board of Education, overruling 
the infamous decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, which are cases that you, depending on whether you're in the U.S. or out of the U.S., may not know, dealt with segregation in schools and the constitutional upholding of segregation and then Brown versus Board of Education overturning segregation. Can the court be wrong? Yes. Do courts get it wrong? Yes. Is it slow AF to fix when the courts get it wrong? Yes. This court sees uh, Roe versus Wade as being wrong, and this being a 50-odd year march towards fixing that. They go on to illustrate the factors that should be considered when deciding whether a precedent should be overruled and lists those five factors as the nature of the court's error, the quality of the reasoning in the underlying case, the workability of the prior case, the effect on the other areas of law, and the reliance interests. Um, and states briefly with reliance interest, overruling Roe and Casey will not upend concrete reliance interests like those that developed in cases involving property and contract rights. I will just note the number of times that the court did point out the reliance interests gives me hope that we will not see this Supreme Court try to overrule things like gay marriage um, because the property and contract rights are so much more deeply embedded here. And they do go to a length to talk about the fact that abortions are generally unplanned activity and that reproductive planning could take virtually immediate account of any sudden change in the law different than individuals who are married and own property together and own um have you know have their their lives built together have health insurance together have state recognized rights together the amount of property and contract interest that would be upended should they change something like marriage fundamentally changing marriage um would be different than a case like uh, this, where they're saying abortion rights don't lean into those reliance interests the same way. You may disagree with that assessment, um, but they are talking and distinguishing very heavily that abortions are unplanned things, that reproductive choice and reproductive planning can be changed uh, relatively quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So I am hopeful that the court will stick to its word that this case will not upend other rights. The dissent is nervous about that, as I know many of you are, but I think the reliance interest prong here, while they went to lengths to point out why the reliance interest in abortion is not the same as in other cases, I can see... <laughs> If they try to undermine that, I will absolutely lose my mind. Let's just Emily opinion time. But the reliance interests are different when you've built a life and a marriage together with property, with contract rights, with health care, with all the other state recognized things that come with marriage, including taxes. I mean, tr is it really cynical of me to be like, will the government ever give up married filing jointly? Um no, I don't think that they will. And I hope that they will. And I don't mean to be flippant of that because I know um, so many are now worried that their marriage is next. And I very much hope that that's not the case. The court says in this opinion that that's not the case. The dissent says, I don't agree with you the fuck at all. And away we go. Those were the five prongs um, that the court said are settled that you consider in stare decisis in when a case is going to be um, overturned or not overturned. Justice Alito delivering the opinion of the court starts the opinion with abortion presents a profound moral issue on which Americans hold sharply conflicting views. Emily, cases with sharply conflicting views are the ones that you hate talking about the most. Yep, it is. But I also hate people feeling like they don't understand what has happened and being afraid because that's the understand, evaluate, change that I believe in so dearly. And if I can help with the understand bit so that you can evaluate and advocate for the change that you believe in, I am here to do that even when it's uncomfortable because we have to be, nothing's going to change if we don't talk about things that are uncomfortable, right? It just silences us and I'm not going to do that either. 
The court says some believe fervently that a human person comes into being at conception and that abortion ends an innocent life. Others feel just as strongly that any regulation of abortion invades a woman's right to control her own body and prevents women from achieving full equality. Still others in a third group think that abortion should be allowed under some but not all circumstances, and those within this group hold a variety of views about the particular restrictions that should be imposed. For the first time in 185 years after the adoption of the Constitution, each state was permitted to address this issue in accordance with the views of its citizens. Then, in 1973, this court decided Roe versus Wade. Even though the Constitution makes no mention of abortion, the court held that it confers a broad right to obtain one. It did not claim that American law or common law had ever recognized such a right. And that's really the foundation of this court's ruling that abortion is not a constitutional right. I will say there are other rights that are acknowledged by the court as constitutionally protected rights that are also not enumerated rights in the Constitution. That's a right specifically spelled out and listed. And the court will talk about the different ways that that is done under the different amendments where they then interpret rights under those amendments. The court then goes on to talk about Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, where the court revisited Roe, but the members of the court split three ways. They say two justices expressed no desire to change Roe in any way, four others wanted to overrule the decision in its entirety, and the three remaining justices who jointly signed the controlling opinion took a third position. Their opinion did not endorse Roe's reasoning, remember that's one of the prongs of stare decisis, and it even hinted that one or more of its authors might have reservations about whether the Constitution protects the right to abortion, but the opinion concluded that stare decisis, which calls for prior decisions to be followed in most instances, required adherence to what it called Roe's central holding, that a state may not constitutionally protect fetal life before viability, even if that holding was wrong. They said anything less, the opinion claimed would undermine respect for this court and the rule of law, which the dissent gets into quite a bit. They go on to say that Casey threw out Roe's trimester scheme and Roe had implemented a way to evaluate when it was appropriate to regulate or not regulate based on the trimesters of a pregnancy. Casey threw out that reasoning and substituted a new rule of, they say, uncertain origin under which states were forbidden to adopt any regulation that imposed a quote unquote undue burden on a woman's right to have an abortion. They say that the decision provided no clear guidance about what the difference between a due and undue burden is, but the three justices who authored the controlling opinion, quote, called the contending sides of a national controversy to end their national division. They go on to say, as has become increasingly apparent in the intervening years, Casey did not achieve that goal. The goal to end the national controversy over the division over abortion. They say Americans continue to hold passionate and widely divergent views on abortion and state legislatures have acted accordingly. Some have recently enacted laws allowing abortion with few restrictions at all stages of pregnancy. Others have tightly restricted abortion beginning well before viability. And in this case, 26 states have expressly asked this court to overrule Roe and Casey and allow the states to regulate or prohibit pre-viability abortions before they then talk about the law that's before them in this case from the state of Mississippi, a law that prohibits abortion after the 15 week, 15th week of pregnancy. Um, and then they go through the long history of how the court recognized abortion as a constitutional right when it's not an enumerated right, meaning the words do not appear in the constitution keeping in mind that there are rights where the words to those rights do not appear in the Constitution. They say that we hold Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. That provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right must be, quote, deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, end quote, and quote, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, end quote. And that's quoting Washington v. Glucksburg. I'm sure a lot of you are like, but how can we determine 
what constitutional rights are deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, where there are some things that were deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition that aren't specifically mentioned in the Constitution or were specifically constitutional that are now no longer rights. I completely understand. This is how they are getting to this is not a constitutional right. It's why those that are opposed to this ruling are very nervous about other rulings that rely on the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to interpret rights to the people of the United States that aren't expressly mentioned in the Constitution because the Constitution, you know, was drafted before, I don't know, women were, you know, considered citizens. Well, people who are black weren't considered citizens. You know, there there were a lot of things at the founding that aren't true today. And that's just going to people. That's not even getting into technology and accessibility and all the other things that have changed in modern times. So with that, there that is where the nervousness comes in as they are saying, look, they rely on the due process clause. We don't think they can rely on the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The majority goes on to, well, we should talk. Emily, what's the due process clause of the 14th Amendment? I realize we should probably talk about that. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, largely called the Privileges and Immunities Clause, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So you've got the Privileges and Immunities Clause of that. You've got no no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process, which is the due process clause. And then you get nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, the equal protection clause. So three parts of the 14th Amendment. Hopefully that little vignette was helpful. Let us get back into what, why the majority here finds the 14th Amendment to be so controlling because that was the right to abortion was put under the 14th Amendment, and they are saying it does not uh, fall under this category. They say that indeed when the 14th Amendment was adopted, three quarters of the states made abortion a crime at all stages of pregnancy. The abortion right is also critically different from any other right that this court has held to fall within the 14th Amendment's protection of quote-unquote liberty. Rose defenders characterize the abortion right as similar to the rights recognized in past decisions involving matters such as intimate sexual relationships, contraception, and marriage, but abortion is fundamentally different, as both Roe and Casey acknowledged, because it destroys what those decisions call quote-unquote fetal life, and what the law now before us describes as a quote-unquote unborn human being. So they are saying that the liberty, life liberty, Um, clause in the 14th Amendment with regard to abortion is distinguishable based on, you know, distinguishable from other things like marriage, contraception, and sexual relations, that those things are different because they are not involving fetal life. And that's why, and they go on to say later multiple times, that other decisions should not be at risk based on this decision, that this decision is returning the decision regarding abortion to be regulated by states and the people's elected representatives. Because We are in a representative democracy, which means your representatives need to listen to you, and if they don't, they need to go. This becomes more important. If the court is going to return rights to the states, then the people at the states have to listen to the people that vote for them. That is the only way that all works together. They go on to argue that they believe that Roe was egregiously wrong from the start, the decision was exceptionally weak, and that the decision had damaging consequences. It is time to heed the Constitution, they say, and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. They go on to say the permissibility of abortion and the limitations upon it are to be resolved like most important questions in our democracy by citizens trying to persuade one another and then voting. And that comes from Casey, from Justice Scalia's concurring judgment in part and dissenting in part. The majority then says that is what the Constitution and the law, well, the rule of law, demand. The majority then goes on to talk about what they were asked to do. 
and the concurring opinion disagrees with this. And I thought the disagreement was very interesting. The majority says we granted Sir Shirari the review to resolve the question whether, quote, all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. And the petitioner's primary defense of the Mississippi Act in question here is that Roe and Casey were wrongly decided and that, quote, the act is constitutional because it satisfies the rational basis review. Respondent answers that allowing Mississippi to ban pre-viability abortions would be no different than overruling Roe and Casey entirely. They tell us that there are, quote, unquote, no half measures available. We must either reaffirm or overrule Roe and Casey. And that's the brief for the respondents, those arguing that the, that the ban in Mississippi was against the Constitution. So in the concurrence, it is pointed out that there is an in-between. So when we get to the concurrence, this part, they are saying no, the majority says that there are no half measures, and they take that from the respondents, but I disagree. There is a narrower construction here. And in the majority opinion, they say no, even if the, we agreed with the concurrence, we're just kicking the can down the road and putting off this decision, and we're going to keep having to re-answer this decision. The dissent then says, well, you're going to keep having to answer this decision because now states are going to do all kinds of who knows what wackadoodly shit, and you're still going to have to decide this. Of course, that's not exactly what the dissent says, but the dissent says, look, there we see a flood of potential issues, people going from one state to another state to seek an abortion. Then what? People advertising um, from a state where abortion is legal to a state where abortion isn't legal. Isn't that a First Amendment right? But are they allowed to advertise in this state? So the dissent goes through a lot of other um, issues that can arise from this ruling saying, okay, well, even if you're not kicking the can down the road on this, you've created this wave of other problems. So you're not done deciding this, even if you say this will settle the issue forever. It's for the states to decide, the dissent says, no, you are now going to have to decide, or we now as a court are going to have to decide a whole lot of other things. The court then tells us how they walk through this question, saying, first, we explain the standard that our cases have used in determining whether the 14th Amendment's reference to quote-unquote liberty protects a particular right. Two, we examine whether the right at issue in this case is rooted in our nation's history and tradition and whether it is an essential component of what we have considered as ordered liberty. And three, we consider a right to obtain an abortion is part of a broader entrenched right that is supported by other precedents. And that is how they walk through the rest of this decision. They say that Roe was remarkably loose in its treatment of the constitutional text. It held that the abortion right, which is not mentioned in the Constitution, is part of a right to privacy, which is also not mentioned in the Constitution. And that privacy right, Roe observed, has been found to spring from no fewer than five different constitutional provisions, the First, Fourth, Fifth, Ninth, and Fourteenth Amendments. The court's discussion left open at least three ways in which some combination of these provisions could protect the abortion right. And Roe leaving open that discussion also left this case open for what we're ultimately now seeing, which is it being overturned. One possibility was that the right was found in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights of, to the people. Another was that the right was rooted in the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendment or in some combination of those provisions and that this right had been incorporated in the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, just as many other Bill of Rights provisions had been then incorporated. Um, and then a third path was that the first, fourth, and fifth amendments played no role and that the right was simply a component of the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Roe expressed the feeling that the 14th Amendment was the provision that did the work, but its message seemed to be that the abortion right could be found somewhere in the Constitution and that specifying its exact location was not, par um, was not of paramount importance. The Casey court did not defend this unfocused analysis and instead grounded its decision solely on the theory that the right to obtain an abortion is part of the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment due process clause. And that's how we get to this is protected, was protected by the 14th Amendment due process clause. And that is what is being overturned here, that they are finding that the 14th Amendment due process clause, the liberty protection does not include 
the right to an abortion, that that is for the states to regulate. The court went through an analysis of abortion rights or illegality, whether it was illegal, not illegal, could be obtained, not obtained, back all the way to the 13th century, and whether or not a woman who was who had an abortion, whether the person who performed it could be criminally punished, whether if the woman died in the course of that, then the person could be um, charged with homicide, whether if a pregnant woman was injured and lost the baby, then somebody could be charged with homicide for the loss of the baby and those those types of regulations and went through them uh, at length. The dissent also points out that the majority went back to the 13th century to draw for rights in 2022. They pointed that out with a little bit of snark. I'm not judging the snark, by the way. Dissents are meant to be somewhat snarky. And in fact, at least in law school, I always appreciated a snarky dissent. It at least gave some color to the things that you were reading and you're going, oh, they don't just all agree in a scholarly way. Interesting. The court comes around to stating the proposition that the trend in the territories that would become the last 13 states was similar. All of them criminalized abortion at all stages of pregnancy between 1850 and 1919. They say by the end of the 1950s, according to the Roe Court's own count, statutes in all but four states and the District of Columbia prohibit abortion, however and whenever performed unless done to save or preserve the life of the mother. The court goes on to say this overwhelming consensus endured until the day that Roe was decided. At that time, also by the Roe Court's own count, a substantial majority, 30 states, still prohibited abortion at all stages except to save the life of the mother. And uh, they say, and though Roe discerned a, quote, trend toward liberalization in and about, quote, one third of the states, end quote, those states still criminalized some abortions and regulated them more stringently than Roe would allow. So that is the history that they are leaning on to say whether or not um, this is part of the ordered liberty and tradition of history. The court concludes that the inescapable conclusion is that a right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. On the contrary, an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment persisted from the earliest days of the common law until 1973. The court then starts getting into talking about the post-Casey decisions like Lawrence versus Texas, the right to engage in private consensual sexual acts, and um Oberfeld, and I always, the G in Oberfell always messes me up, and I never know if I pronounce it correctly, but Oberfell versus Hodges, which is the right to marry a person of same sex or the same sex marriage case, they say these attempts to justify abortion through appeals to a broader right to autonomy and to define one's, quote, concept of existence prove too much. Uh, that's a quote from Casey. They say these criteria at a high level of generality could license fundamental rights to illicit drug use, prostitution, and the like. Don't get me started on how I feel about the government regulating these things. I am not here to go down a rabbit hole on that today. But it's interesting that they talk about the respondent's brief trying to justify the right through cases that actually came after they say what sharply distinguishes the abortion right from the rights recognized in the cases on which Roe and Casey rely is something that both those decisions acknowledge. Abortion destroys what those decisions call quote unquote potential life and what the law at issue in this case regards as life of an quote unquote unborn human being. None of the other decisions cited by Roe and Casey involve the critical moral question posed by abortion. They are therefore in opposite. They do not support the right to obtain an abortion, and by the same token, our conclusion that the Constitution does not confer such a right does not undermine them in any way, so should not undermine the other cases. We will see if that holds true, and the court says it in a few other places, and I want to point those other places out now. In talking about the dissent, the court says the most striking feature of the dissent is the absence of any serious discussion of the legitimacy of the state's interest in protecting fetal life. 
This is evident in the analogy that the dissent draws between the abortion right and the rights recognized in Griswold, a right to contraception. Uh, Einstalt, the same. Lawrence, sexual conduct with a member of the same sex. Oberfell, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, which is the same sex marriage case. They say perhaps this is designed to stoke unfounded fear that our decision will imperil those other rights, but the dissent's analogy is objectionable for a more important reason. What it reveals about the dissent's views on the protection of what Roe calls, quote, potential life. The exercise of the rights at issue in Griswold, Einstadt, Lawrence, and Oberfeld does not destroy, quote unquote, a potential life, but an abortion has that effect. So if the rights at issue in those cases are fundamentally the same as the right recognized in Roe v. Casey, the implication is clear. The Constitution does not permit the state to regard the destruction of a quote unquote potential life as a matter of any significance. So they again try to distinguish the different cases. What the, Well, we'll get to what the dissent says, but the dissent says these rights are all predicated on that liberty clause. So if you're saying that that's not enshrined in the Constitution, that's not part of ordered liberty, all of these rights fall into that. I want to get to the other places where the court talks about why this case is distinguishable from the other rights that we have just talked about, but the court is moving into stare decisis and their analysis of that, and I don't want to skip over it and then lose my place coming back, to be perfectly honest. The court says... When one of our constitutional decisions goes astray, the country is usually stuck with the bad decision unless we correct our own mistake. An erroneous constitutional decision can be fixed by amending the Constitution, but our Constitution is notoriously hard to amend. Therefore, in appropriate circumstances, we must be willing to reconsider and, if necessary, overrule constitutional decisions. Some of our most important constitutional decisions have overruled prior precedents. We mentioned three, and then they mentioned Broward versus Board of Education. The court repudiated the separate but equal doctrine, which had allowed states to maintain racially segregated schools and other facilities. Yes, the court compared abortion to segregation. That happened. They compare other cases as well. They go on and compare West Coast Hotel versus Parish overruling Atkins versus Children's Hospital, which held that a law setting minimum wages for women violated the liberty protection by the Fifth Amendment's due process clause. West Coast Hotel signaled the demise of an entire line of important precedents that had protected the individual liberty right against state and federal health and welfare legislation, uh, holding invalid the law setting maximum working hours, holding invalid the law banning contracts forbidding employees from joining unions, holding invalid laws, fixing the weight of loaves of bread. And then they go to Virginia, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. And this is not a line of cases I even remember studying. They say after the lapse of only three years, the court overruled Minersville School District versus Gobitis. I think I'm pronouncing that right properly that held a public school that held public school students could not be compelled to salute the flag in violation of their sincere beliefs. And that is a case that they talk about a lot because it was overturned within just three years. So clearly not much had changed. And then they go into evaluating those cases at length and others where they have overturned past precedents and then get into weighing the five factors that we talked about. The court argues that in the decision in Roe, the court had usurped the power Quote, to address a question of profound moral and social importance that the Constitution unequivocally leaves for the people. In talking about the nature of the court's error, they say that Roe was egregiously wrong on the day it was decided, and then go from there talking about the usurped power of the people. They go through the quality of the reasoning and take issue with the reasoning underlying Roe. This is not the first, first court to do so. Uh, scholars have also done so. They contend that Roe uh, relied on an erroneous historical recitation. No, they call it a narrative, an erroneous historical narrative. Then they get to the work workability prong where they talk about whether this undue burden test that Casey supplemented Roe's trimester test for was workable. They determine that it was not workable. They get into the effects on other areas of law, 
and say that Roe and Casey have led to a distortion of many important but unrelated legal doctrines, and that effect provides further support for overruling those decisions. They say that members of the court have repeatedly lamented that, quote, no legal rule or doctrine is safe from ad hoc nullification by this court when an occasion for its application arises in a case involving state regulation of abortion. They go on to say that the court's abortion cases have diluted the strict standard for facial constitutional challenges. Then they talk about the reliance interests and talk, as I said at the beginning, about the fact that these are interests different than contractual interests that can be uh, dealt with relatively quickly. They conclude that section by saying our decision returns the issue of abortion to those legislative bodies, and it allows women on both sides of the abortion issue to seek to affect the legislative process by influencing public opinion, lobbying legislatures, voting, and running for office. Women are not without electoral or political power. And then they talk about the power of women in voting, saying that in the last election in November 2020, women who make up around 51.5% of the population of Mississippi constituted 55.5% of the voters who cast ballots, saying that this is not a time when women don't have a political voice. And then they talk again about the other rights. They say that uh, abortion is inherently different from marital intimacy, marriage, and procreation. They go on to say that, and to ensure that our decision is not misunderstood or mischaracterized, we emphasize that our decision concerns the constitutional right to abortion and no other right. Nothing in this opinion should be understood to cast doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion. Again, they are trying to distinguish this case I think partly because of the dissent um, of calling into question all laws. However, Justice Thomas's concurrence does call into question the other laws. This opinion does not. But Justice Thomas said, well, if we're going to look at substantive due process, finding other laws through due process, then we should look at all of these. The majority opinion says, no, we are only talking about this issue and none other. And the dissent says, but what is stopping you then from undoing the others? And that is the uncertainty that I see causing so much uh, anguish, really, in, in the wake of this opinion of what comes next. Is there another shoe to drop? The court says, we do not pretend to know how our political system or society will respond to today's overruling Roe and Casey. And even if we could foresee what will happen, I think they probably could have especially after the leaked opinion, but that's just my own opinion. And even if we could foresee what will happen, we would have no authority to let that knowledge influence our decision. We can only do our job, which is to interpret the law, apply longstanding principles of stare decisis, and decide this case accordingly. We therefore hold that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion, Roe and Casey must be overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion must be returned to the people and their elected representatives. And that really is the crux of the holding in this case. And now we're going to go to that one concurrence that I found very interesting. I should note that this case also has multiple appendices, one of statutes criminalizing abortion at all stages of pregnancies, in the states existing in 1868. And then the other appendix containing the statutes criminalizing abortion at all stages in each of the territories that became states and the District of Columbia. Also, two appendices, appendices, appendici. We will talk more about Justice Thomas's concurrence as it's referenced in the dissent, because I really do want to get to the concurring opinion of Chief Justice Roberts. But just to note, Kavanaugh also has a concurrence that, yes, there are three concurring opinions. In Kavanaugh's concurrence, he does state, again, first is the question of how this decision will affect other precedents involving issues such as contraception and marriage in particular. The decisions in Griswold, Einstadt, Loving versus Virginia, and Oberfeld. I emphasize 
what the court today states. Overruling Roe does not mean the overruling of those precedents and does not threaten or cast doubt on those precedents. And further says, second, as I see it, some of the other abortion-related legal questions raised by today's decision are not especially difficult as a constitutional matter. For example, may a state bar resident of that state from traveling to another state to obtain an abortion? In my view, the answer is no, based on the constitutional right to interstate travel. So this is addressing the dissent kind of specifically. May a state retroactively impose liability or punishment for an abortion that occurred before today's decision takes effect? In my view, the answer is no, based on the due process clause. So again, another concurrence saying this does not impact other rights and you should not see an issue between state to state because the constitution specifically grants the right to interstate travel. And those are questions that I know have already come up that states are going to grapple with. Do I think cases like that will end up before the court? Yes. Are people going to get stuck in the middle of all of this as the states and the courts parse this out? Yes. And that's the side effect that the dissent talks about more is the people that are going to get caught in the middle of this ruling, because no matter what side of the issue you fall on, um, when courts make changes like this, parsing out everything that means is going to be slow. And there are going to be those that are stuck without a good workable option. And that is just a reality because states are going to pass laws. Those laws are going to get challenged or blocked. And there is going to be a long judicial process back and forth as the states take back over power. And it's evaluated what new laws mean for each state based on the state's constitution and based on other rights in the constitution. During Chief Justice Roberts' concurrence, he pointed out what the initial question was before the court and saw a third option to uphold the law in Mississippi without overturning Roe. And I thought it was very interesting that the question before the court seemed to change in Justice Roberts' opinion. Justice Roberts says none of this, however, requires that we also take the dramatic step of altogether eliminating the abortion right first recognized in Roe. Mississippi itself previously argued as much to this court in this litigation. When the state petitioned for our review, its basic request was straightforward, quote, clarify whether abortion prohibitions before viability are always unconstitutional. The state made a number of strong arguments that the answer is no. Arguments that, as discussed, I find persuasive. And it went out of its way to make it clear that it was not asking the court to repudiate entirely the right to choose whether to terminate a pregnancy. Quote, to be clear, the question presented in this petition does not require the court to overturn Roe or Casey. Mississippi tempered that statement with an oblique one sentence footnote intimating that if the court could not reconcile Roe and Casey with with current facts or other cases, it, quote, should not retain erroneous precedent in a footnote, it argued to overturn it. In a footnote, but the state never argued that we should grant review for that purpose. After we granted certiorari, however, Mississippi changed course. In its principal brief, the state bluntly announced that the court should overturn Roe and Casey. The Constitution does not protect a right to an abortion, it argued, and a state should be able to prohibit elective abortions if a rational basis supports doing so. The court now rewards that gambit noting three times that the parties presented, quote, no half measures, end quote, and argued that, quote, we must either reaffirm or overrule Roe and Casey. Given these two options, the majority picks the latter. This framing is not accurate. In its brief on the merits, Mississippi, in fact, argued at length that a decision simply rejecting the viability rule would result in a judgment in its favor. But even if the state had not argued as much, it would not matter. There is no rule that parties can confine this court to disposing of their case on a particular ground, let alone when review was sought and granted on a different one. 
Our established practice is instead not to, quote, formulate a rule of constitutional law broader than what is required by the precise facts to which it is to be applied. And Justice Roberts goes on to say in his concurrence that I agree with upholding the Mississippi law. I disagree with overturning Roe and Casey, but not so far to concur in part and dissent in part, but to say that this court goes broader than necessary to decide this case, which is what the court accuses Roe of doing. He said that this case could be more narrowly tailored and the ruling could in fact be more narrowly tailored. It was an interesting concurrence in that it was a concurrence. Justice Roberts says, we should begin with the narrowest basis for disposition, proceeding to consider a broader one only if necessary to resolve the case at hand. It is only when there is no valid narrower ground of decision that we should go on to address the broader issue, such as whether a constitutional decision should be overturned. So again, saying that there's a clear path to deciding this case correctly without overruling Roe all the way down to the studs. Recognize that the viability line must be discarded, as the majority rightly does, and leave for another day whether to reject any right to abortion at all. And that is where the majority, when they argue against this concurrence, says you can't kick the can down the road. We're just going to have to decide it again because there is a breadth of cases coming up that don't address the 15-week issue, but then address a 10-week issue or a five-week issue and so on and so forth. So it has to be addressed because there are all these cases that are coming after this that are addressing other lines. So we're not going to kick the can down the road. We are going to decide it all here and we should. But I can't talk about the majority opinion without pointing out these interesting parts from the concurrence saying there was a narrower way to construe this and we should construe things the most narrowly. And with that, we're going to move on to the dissent. The dissenting opinion is the opinion of Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, and Kagan. It is a long and unhappy dissent, as one could understand when we are talking about uh, a constitutional right or not a constitutional right. And it starts with, for a half century, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey have protected the liberty and equality of women. Roe held and Casey reaffirmed that the Constitution safeguards a woman's right to decide for herself whether to bear a child. Goes on to say Roe held and Casey reaffirmed that in the first stages of pregnancy, the government could not make that decision for women. The government could not control a woman's body or the course of a woman's life. It could not determine what the woman's future would be. Respecting a woman as an autonomous being and granting her full equality meant giving her substantial choice over this most personal and most consequential of all life decisions. And again, if the court had found this right in equal protection grounds and perhaps not due process grounds in the life liberty due process and substantive due process grounds, we might not be here. Also, if the government had ever codified this as a right, or not a right, either way, we would also not be here. But this was not an equal protection case. So when they're talking about equality, Roe was not Roe was not decided on equality grounds, even though when you listen to this and you're like morality versus legality, equality means something different. This was not decided on equal protection grounds. It was decided on due process grounds, and that is a distinction that matters very much to this court and ultimately to the overturning of this case. If this had been decided on an equal protection ground, could this have been different? I think so, but it wasn't, and here we are. They go on to say today the court disregards that balance. It says that from the very moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of. I disagree. Agree that that's what the court says, because I believe the court says that the state now decides, but the state can decide that that's true. So it is a, a minimal disagreement. They say a state can force her to bring a pregnancy to term, even at the steepest personal and familial costs. They say that an abortion restriction the majority holds is permissible whenever rational, the lowest level of scrutiny known to the law 
And because, as the court has often stated, protecting fetal life is rational, states will feel free to enact all manner of restrictions. The Mississippi law at issue here bars abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. Under the majority's ruling, though, another state's law could do so after 10 weeks or five or three or one or again from the moment of fertilization. They say states have already passed such laws in anticipation of today's rulings. More will follow. Some states have enacted laws extending to all forms of abortion procedure, including taking medication in one's own home. They have passed laws without any exceptions for when the woman is the victim of rape or incest. Under those laws, a woman will have to bear her rapist child or a young girl, her father's, no matter if doing so will destroy her life. And that is really the foundation of the principles argued by the dissent. The majority opinion says that these are all policy arguments and that those policy arguments fall to the representatives of the people, which again puts this squarely in the hands of politicians. And they go through a lot of talking about what has already happened in the states where these laws have already been um, enacted, mentioning the Texas law, saying, quote, as Texas has recently shown, a state can turn neighbor against neighbor, enlisting fellow citizens in an effort to root out anyone who tries to get an abortion or to assist them in doing so. That is a law that is currently being challenged in Texas. The dissent also says most threatening of all, no language in today's decision stops the federal government from prohibiting abortions nationwide, once again, from the moment of conception and without exceptions for rape or incest. If that happens, quote, the views of an individual state's citizens, end quote, will not matter. And if the federal government were to pass a law banning abortion, I don't think that anything in this decision would stop them. But if they were to pass a law protecting abortion, I don't think anything in this law would stop them. I think that argument does go both ways, depending on what the government would do. Again, putting this decision in the hands of politicians. Whatever the exact scope of the coming laws, one result of today's decision is certain. The curtailment of women's rights and of their status as free and equal citizens. Yesterday, the Constitution guaranteed that a woman confronted with an unplanned pregnancy could, within reasonable limits, make her own decision about whether to bear a child with all the life-transforming consequences that act involves. And in thus safeguarding each woman's reproductive freedom, the Constitution also protected the ability of women to participate equally in this nation's economic and social life. They say, but no longer, as of today, this court holds, a state can always force a woman to give birth, prohibiting even the earliest abortions. A state can thus transform what, when freely undertaken, is a wonder into what, when forced, may be a nightmare. It goes on to say some women, especially women of means, will find ways around the state's assertions of powers. Others, those without money or childcare or ability to take time off from work, will not be so fortunate. The court then goes on to talk about other precedents, saying that the court has linked it for decades to other settled freedoms, it being the right to abortion, involving bodily integrity, familial relationships, and procreation. Most obviously, the right to terminate a pregnancy arose straight out of the right to purchase and use contraceptive. In turn, those rights led more recently to the rights of same-sex intimacy and marriage. They are all part of the same constitutional fabric, protecting autonomous decision-making over the most personal life decisions. The majority, or to be more accurate, most of it, is eager to tell us today that nothing it does quote, cast doubts on precedents that do not concern abortion. And then they quote um, Justice Thomas advocating the overruling of Griswold, Lawrence, and Oberfeld. And they say, but how could that be? The lone rationale for what the majority does today is that the right to elect an abortion is not, quote, deeply rooted in history. Not until Roe, the majority argues, did people think abortion fell within the constitutional guarantee of liberty. The same could be said, though, of most of the rights the majority claims it is not tampering with. The majority could write just as long an opinion showing, for example, that until the mid-20th century, quote, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to obtain contraceptives. So one of two things must be true. Either the majority does not really believe its own reasoning, or if it does, all rights that have no history stretching back to the mid 
19th century are insecure. Either the masses, either the mass of the majority's opinion is hypocrisy or additional constitutional rights are under threat. It is one or the other. And that is where I think we're seeing a lot of conversation around whether or not other rights that are founded in substantive due process are at risk. The majority says they're not. The dissent says, but how could that be? The dissent goes on to argue that the majority makes this change, the overturning of Roe and Casey, based on a single question. Did the reproductive right recognized in Roe and Casey exist in 1868, the year when the 14th Amendment was ratified? The majority says, and with this much we agree, that the answer to this question is no. In 1868, there was no nationwide right to end a pregnancy and no thought that the 14th Amendment provided one. Of course, the majority opinion refers as well to some later and earlier history. On the one side of the 1868, it goes back as far as the 13th, the 13th century. Yes, it said that there. But that turns out to be wheel spinning. And then they go into why and say, second, and embarrassingly for the majority, early law, in fact, does provide some support for abortion rights. Common law authorities did not treat abortion as a crime before quickening the point at when a fetus moves in the womb, and early American law followed the common law rule. So the criminal law of that early time might be taken as roughly constant with Roe and Casey's different treatment of early and late abortions. Better then to move forward in time, on the other side of 1868, the majority occasionally notes that many states barred abortion up till the time of Roe. That is convenient for the majority, but it is window dressing, they say, as the same majority plus one just informed us post-ratification adoption or acceptance of laws that are inconsistent with the original meaning of the constitutional text obviously cannot overcome or alter that text. They say that the majority's core legal postulate then is that we in the 21st century must read the 14th Amendment just as its ratifiers did. Or as said more particularly, if those people did not understand reproductive rights as part of the guarantee of liberty conferred in the 14th Amendment, then those rights did not exist. As an initial matter, note a mistake in the just preceding sentence. We referred there to the quote unquote people who ratified the 14th Amendment. What rights did those, quote, unquote, people have in their heads at the time? But of course, quote, people did not ratify the 14th Amendment. Men did. So it is perhaps not surprising that the ratifiers were not perfectly attuned to the importance of reproductive rights for women's liberty or for their own capacity to participate as equal members of our nation. And I think, again, that's where this being addressed under equal protection may have been better precedent. I am not a constitutional law scholar, but here we are. The dissent goes on to say, the framers both in 1788 and 1868 understood that the world changes. So they did not define rights by reference to the specific practices existing at the time. Instead, the framers defined rights in general terms to permit future evolution in their scope and meaning. And over the course of our history, this court has taken up the framers invitation. It has kept true to the framers principles by applying them in new ways, responsive to new societal understandings and conditions. Nowhere has this approach been more prevalent than in construing the majestic but open ended words of the 14th Amendment, the guarantees of liberty and equality for all. And nowhere has that approach produced prouder moments for this country and the court. It says, consider the example of Oberfeld a few years ago. The court there confronted a claim based on Washington versus Glucksburg that the 14th Amendment must be defined in the most circumscribed manner with central reference to specific historical practices, exactly the view today's majority follows. And the court specifically rejected that view. In doing so, the court reflected on what was on what the proposed historical circumscribed approach would have meant for interracial marriage. The 14th Amendment ratifiers did not think it gave black and white people a right to marry each other. To the contrary, contemporaneous practice deemed that act quite as unprotected as abortion. Yet the court in Loving versus Virginia read the 14th Amendment to embrace the Loving's union. 
If Oberfeld explained, quote, rights were defined by who exercised them in the past, then received practices could serve as their own continued justification, even when the conflict with liberty and equality as later and more broadly understood. The Constitution does not freeze for all time the original view of what those rights guarantee or how they apply. That does not mean that anything goes. The majority wishes people to think there are but two alternatives, accept the original applications of the 14th Amendment and no others, or to surrender to judges' own ardent views, ungrounded in law, about the liberty that Americans should enjoy. At least that idea is what the majority sometimes tries to convey. At other times, the majority tries to assure the public that it has no designs or rights, for example, to contraception, that arose only in the back half of the 20th century. In other words, that it is happy to pick and choose in accordance with individual preferences. But that is a matter we discuss later. The dissent is then critical of a part of the majority opinion that I didn't touch on much because for time we needed to keep moving. And the court said in returning the right to decide to the states it was being neutral. The dissent disagrees, saying, would it be scrupulously neutral for the court to eliminate these rights too, talking about the rights of contraception and same-sex marriage? The point of all these examples is that when it comes to rights, the court does not act neutrally when it leaves everything up to the states. And that is a big part of their point here too. Leaving it up to the states does not protect rights. The court says it's them being, the majority says it's them being neutral as to what the constitution guarantees. If there's no constitutional guarantee, then People can talk to their legislatures. Legislatures write the laws. The courts don't write the laws. They just interpret the laws. And the dissent says, no, leaving it up to the states is not you being neutral. In getting towards the end of this dissent, the dissenting opinion says, finally, the majority's ruling today invites a host of questions about interstate conflicts. And of course, the Supreme Court resolves interstate conflicts. Can a state bar women from traveling to another state to obtain an abortion? Can a state prohibit advertising out-of-state abortions or helping women get to out-of-state providers? Can a state interfere with the mailing of drugs used for medication abortions? The Constitution protects travel and speech and interstate commerce, so today's ruling will give rise to a host of new constitutional questions. Far from removing the court from the abortion issue, the majority puts the court at the center of the coming interjurisdictional abortion wars. In short, the majority does not save judges from unwieldy pests or extricate them from a sphere of controversy. To the contrary, it discards a known, workable, and predictable standard in favor of something novel and probably far more complicated. It forces the court to wade further into hotly contested issues, including moral and philosophical ones that the majority criticizes Roe and Casey for addressing. And the dissent wraps up by talking about what the Casey court says, quoting Justice Stewart, Casey explained that to do so, to reverse prior law upon a ground no firmer than a change in the court's membership would invite the view that this institution is a little different from the two political branches of the government. No view, Casey thought, could do quote, more lasting injury to this court and to the system of law, which it is our abiding mission to serve. For overruling Roe, Casey concluded the court would pay a terrible price. The justices who wrote those words, O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter, they were justices of wisdom. They would not have won any contest for the kind of ideological purity some court watchers want justices to deliver, but if there were awards for justices who left this court better than they found it, and who, for that reason, left this country better, and the rule of law stronger, sign those justices up. They knew that, quote, the legitimacy of the court is earned over time. They also would have recognized that it can be destroyed much more quickly. They worked hard to avert that outcome in Casey. The American public, they thought, should never conclude that its constitutional protections hung by a thread, and a new majority adhering to new, quote, doctrinal school could, quote, by a dint of numbers alone expunge their rights. It is hard, no, it is impossible to conclude that anything else has happened here. 
One of us once said that, quote, it is not often in the law that so few have so quickly changed so much. Uh, Justice Breyer breaking the promise of Brown, the resegregation of America's schools. For all of us in our time on this court, that has never been more true than today. In overruling Roe and Casey, this court betrays its guiding principles. With sorrow for this court, but more for the many millions of American women who have today lost a fundamental constitutional protection, we dissent. And that is the end of the dissenting opinion, save an appendix. This appendix analyzes the in full each of the 28 cases the majority says support today's decision to overrule Roe. And it does, in fact, go through the underlying decisions, which is, again, why I am attaching it if you would like to read the 200-plus uh, pages of this decision for yourself. But those are the two sides. Um, do I think that this will bring a wave of new litigation? Yes. That will not be settled quickly. Will there be answers to any of this quickly? No. It will be uncomfortable. There will be laws that are uncomfortable. They will be challenged in courts, and there will be people stuck in the middle. And that is going to be the hardest part of those that are stuck in the middle, because I don't think anyone on any side of this issue wants that, or at least I hope not. Is that overly naive of me? I very much hope not. Um, because people, I really, truly hope, don't want others to be harmed. And we will see. This is in the hands of politicians, which means voting is going to matter more than ever. What will come of this? I don't know. Will this change midterm elections? I don't know. Um, will I be watching what goes on in the courts? Yes. Will I regularly be commenting on what the Supremes are doing? No. Um I thought that it was helpful to go through what the courts had said in this case and really try my best to just go through what the courts had said while pointing out the majority opinion and the dissent because it is difficult, it is inflammatory, and so many are not just confused but also frustrated and wanted something more than the headlines. And I hope that this breakdown gave you a bit of what each side said and why, or at least a little bit of why Roe was on shaky legal grounds. The Casey court tried to deal with it, but this case has been um, attacked since since it was passed down in 1973. And here in 2022, we've seen it overruled. What this means for stare decisis going forward, we will see. What the court does from here next term, we will see. But for now, this is in the hands of state legislatures and states' rights. So make sure to vote. Um, and if this helped you understand this case a little bit more, please let me know. You, you know how I feel about getting into divisive topics. It's hard. I hope that this breakdown was helpful because that is why I did it. With that, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a lawner. Thank you for going through the Supremes with me a little bit. They are long and wandering. There was lots in this decision. And I hope um, that at least it cleared maybe some things up of what was said and what was not said in this decision. And with that, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. I hope that you are well. And with that, may your family be well. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your gas not be $7 a gallon and may the odds be ever in your favor. Emily, did you do that backwards? Yes. Is it very late when you're recording? Yes. Is this episode already late? Yes. All of the yes. But thank you for being here and I will talk to you in the next one. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.